Hey guys, Coach Pop here. Thanks for joining me for the video cast. Today we're looking at this process of Sinification. That is the spread of Chinese influence throughout the rest of East Asia. Um, in particular, the, the political system and the writing system and the culture associated with that, but also the social consequences of that. Sinification is a process that's rather similar to what happened with Hellenization, uh, the spread of Greek language and culture in the classical period, but um, a little bit different situation insofar as it's not necessarily uh, spreading through conquest. To start with, let's talk about the sign signification of Vietnam. The Han uh, Dynasty occupied the territory that will become known as Vietnam relatively early on, and with them, they spread the idea of Confucianism and the use of Chinese characters for their writing system. But um, historically, there's always been a significant amount of resistance to the spread of Chinese uh, culture and political power. Um, a very famous revolt, one of three really big ones, was led by uh, two women, the Trung sisters, who led a successful revolt uh, in 40 of the Common Era that temporarily sort of uh, kicked the Chinese out. Nonetheless, they would constantly be coming back and, and making the area that we know of uh, as Vietnam a tributary state. That is to say, it was technically independent. It wasn't part of the Chinese empires, but it was paying tribute to China. During the uh, Sui dynasty then, once the dynastic cycle is restarted, Sui Wendi is, is trying to expand and, and that includes territory in Vietnam. But the process of signification at that time is a little bit different because it's essentially just the elite who are adopting Chinese ways. They're, they're seeing this as a way to sort of solidify their control over the rest of the population uh, in a process very similar to what happened with Islam in West Africa, if you remember. Generally speaking, the popular uh, local traditions will remain among the masses, though. Um, eventually, though, it will uh, get its own independence and start a kingdom and then uh, expand southward during the fall of the Tang Dynasty. The, the, the uh, Song, if you remember, were not as strong militarily and they weren't able to hang on to that territory. This was an opportunity then for Vietnam to assert its independence and then as I mentioned, uh, around 1,000 of the Common Era, they start expanding their territory southward. It's not an empire, it's, it's an enlarged, uh, large kingdom, essentially. But one of the significant developments there is they end up coming with, up with their own writing system. And the writing system is based on Chinese characters, but it's not used the same as characters. It's used more like an alphabet. It kind of looks like uh, like Chinese characters, and this was the writing system that was used by the masses. The elite, for a long, long time, continued to use Chinese characters for their writing system, and this will continue until the French occupation in the modern period, which we'll get back to later on. In terms of Korea, the the initial process is very similar. The Han occupy the territory that is now Korea pretty early on. Again bringing with them the idea of Confucianism and the use of Chinese characters. After the fall of the Han, though, uh, the territory that we know of as Korea it breaks up into three kingdoms. And once the Tang Dynasty starts expanding, it's going to reconquer most of that territory. However, uh, it leaves one of those kingdoms uh, sort of in charge so long as they pay tribute to the Tang Dynasty in China, and that is the Silla Kingdom. Um, the process of signification, again, it's relatively similar, but with some significant differences to Vietnam. First of all, it's definitely uh, more or less limited to the elite class, again, seen as a way to sort of solidify their power over their own people. 
But by the time of the Tang Dynasty, this includes Neo-Confucianism, that sort of blending of Confucianism with Buddhist and Taoist ideas, as well as the spread of Buddhism itself. If you remember the Tang Dynasty, uh, the rulers were all practicing Buddhists at the particular time. But unusually, there's some ways where they held on to their own traditions. One of these is a really interesting example called bone ranking which is the, the, the elite of Korea tried to uh, reimagine, re make the Chinese examination system and have their government run by scholars just as the uh, Chinese did. But they held on to this idea that your position within that hierarchy is based on your family line, bone ranking, like literally in your bones that's your, your family line. And so it's this weird combination because theoretically the examination system means anybody who passes the test and it's based on merit exclusively who gets what positions within the government, but then they mix it with this idea of hereditary social position. Another thing that's a little different is whereas Confucianism is a, a really, really uh, significant patriarchy, uh, particularly uh, in terms of the three obediences, Korean society generally has less patriarchy than Chinese, and they kind of continued that. It, the, the tradition in Korea of women having more freedoms than in Japan will continue even as they are uh, signified. Um, the elite will then impose the Chinese culture upon the masses in a kind of top-down fashion. But when the Tang Dynasty falls, that kingdom that had previously been conquered, Goryeo, uh, is, uh, expands. It's, it's slightly different, but it's essentially the, the, the di same dynasty. That's where we get the word Korea, by the way, from Goryeo. But they will sort of occupy the territory that is Korea, but they're still sort of forced into this position of submission by uh, the Song Dynasty, and that will continue until the Mongols show up. The Mongols actually conquer all of the Korean peninsula, but they're seen as liberators by the Koreans because the Mongols are, are not forcing them to be subservient in the way that they viewed the Chinese were doing that. It's also in this time they developed their own writing system called Hangul, which is, again, it looks a little bit like Chinese characters, but it's used in a totally different way. In fact, it's something called a syllabary, where each symbol stands for a uh, syllable, as opposed to an idea the way that it does in the Chinese uh, variation. But what I want to focus uh, much more closely on now is the signification of Japan. And while I'm doing this, consider how this is similar and different to what happens in Vietnam and in Korea. To begin with, let's go back, though, to the Yamato period of Japanese history, called that because the capital is in a city called Yamato. The emperor is in charge at that particular time. Now, here's the thing about the emperor. You'll remember Shintoism is this animistic belief, these, this belief in kami, these nature spirits that are everywhere. But part of this belief system is that the emperor is a direct descendant of the sun. The sun obviously being a significant nature spirit uh, for obvious reasons. And so um, the, the sort of belief system that is prevalent at the time sort of supports this idea that the emperor should be the one in charge. Things start to change though when a prince, Shotoku, um, is really fascinated by Chinese culture. And he's the guy that really sort of sparks the signification of Japan. Um, he's introduced to this by the uh, Tang emissaries who are they're sp trying to spread their influence as far as they can. One of the things that he does is he adopts Chinese characters, the writing system, straight up. That writing system is called kanji in Japan, but it's essentially just using Chinese characters in exactly the same way, but for Japanese words. 
Um, he's also very much uh, interested in spreading the idea of Neo-Confucianism, again, that blending of Confucian thought with uh, Taoist and Buddhist ideas as well. But all of this is sort of crystallized shortly after the prince dies in what are known as the Taika reforms. The Taika reforms are a series of policies and laws that are put in place to try to remake Japan as close as possible to China. Specifically, they adopt the Tang legal system. Just straight up, word for word, their legal code is exactly the same as the one that the Tang dynasty established. They're trying to create a system of centralized authority, whereby the emperor uh, is basically in Japan the same as in uh, China. And part of the consequence of that is the emperor controls all of the land and is supposed to you know, divide this up. If you remember, the Tang Dynasty experimented with something called the equal field system, and that was sort of an idea that was practiced briefly in Japan as well. After the Yamato period, though, we move to the Nara period. And in the Nara period, an empress, Genmei, moves the capital to Nara. So again, the idea is that the capital city is the name of the period here. And this new city that she builds, she literally models it after Xi'an or Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang dynasty. Like, literally, she tries to replicate, replicate the whole city exactly like the Chinese capital city. Signification will continue then in this period, particularly in terms of art and architecture. You see many of the influences from China. Um, the literature continues to be written in the Chinese characters, um, and that's going to continue uh, for a few more centuries. But at the same time, Buddhism continues to spread and spreads into Japan during this time. Now, the variation that spreads into Japan, it's a variation of Mahayana Buddhism, which worships the Buddha as a god, but there's a variety of that from China called Chan Buddhism. And the version that spreads to Japan is essentially the same thing, it's just known as Zen Buddhism. Zen Buddhism focuses very much on uh, individual meditation, sort of mental discipline, um, and, and that tradition, again, comes from that particular variety uh, from China. Uh, Buddhist temples then start to be built all throughout Japan at the same time, again, though, reflecting the architectural practices that are prevalent in China at the time. The Heian period, though, starts to be a kind of transitional period. The, the, the capital city, again, you're seeing a trend here, is moved to what at the time is called Haiyan, which is Kyoto today. And little by little, the Chinese influence is decreasing. That starts when the Tang Dynasty stops sending emissaries to Japan. They're mired in their own problems. If you recall, they've had the An Lushan Rebellion and their capital city is actually occupied. So they're like less worried about trying to spread their influence outside of their borders and more concerned with holding on to power within theirs. At the same time, a new writing system is developed called Kana, which it looks, again, very much like Chinese characters, except for they're used in a totally different way. The Kana are um, syllables in, in a similar way to what the Koreans did with Hangul, but um, it's, it's, it's designed to fit more closely with the Japanese language than the characters did. Um, a great deal of literature is written in that particular language. The court life of the uh, royal family um, is written in this new writing system, and it's a pretty significant list um, you don't need to know these, but the, the first of these is written by a woman who's a courtier called the Pillow Book, where she very detailed descriptions of what is going on living in the court of the royal family there. Uh, many scholars believe that the tale of Genji by Lady Mirasaki was the first novel uh, that was ever written in the world. But it's again depicting the family line of, of an event that we'll get into in just a moment. And then there's also a famous story, The Tale of the Haiki, which is 
uh, has no particular author, an anonymous story, but it is again concerned with the same event that we'll talk about here in just a moment. Over time, though, this elaborate court life gets so dramatic that the imperial family has absolutely no clue what life is like outside of Kyoto. They're insulated in every way, and they're so focused on the daily rituals of their everyday life that they kind of literally lose touch with, with what's going on with everybody else. At the same time, though, the actual political power, the, the power to run the state as the imperial family is so focused on its own daily life, is run by three families, particularly one, the Fujiwara clan, who are basically acting as regents. That is to say, they're the ones that are running the day-to-day -day operations of the uh, government. But there's two other clans that form the warriors of their particular society. And those two clans will then clash in a giant civil war known as the Genpei Wars. And this is a really significant event in uh, Japanese history and culture. The other two clans, the Minamoto and the Taira clans, fight against each other to try to take control from the imperial family. Um, and what's significant about it from a cultural perspective is that it becomes immortalized in their literature. Uh, the tale of Genji, for example, tells the story from one side, one of the clan side, the tale of the Heike from the other one, and it becomes like this kind of cultural memory that's sort of similar to what happens with the Civil War in our society, or a, a different way of looking at it is the Trojan War from the perspective of the Greeks. It just becomes embedded in there. Again, I mentioned this before, the tale of Genji from the Minamoto side, the Heike from the Terra clan, uh, but it's, it's about the same events just from a different perspective. It'd be like telling the story of the Civil War from the perspective of the North and then also telling it from the perspective of the South. Um, again, this is going to be a long-lasting impact, this, this idea of this war. In the end, however, um, the one side does win and establishes a new kind of government, which is called the Kamakura Shogunate. Now, we'll come back to the word shogunate in a moment. The point is this, though. This is the guy who ends up establishing this new government. Minamoto Yoritomo. Minamoto is his family name, so you can see they're sort of replicating that Chinese tradition where your family name comes first. But that also tells you that's the side that won the Genpei Wars. And he names himself as Shogun. Now, a shogunate is a rule by military leaders. It's a military dictatorship, okay? So again, we've got a kind of new form of government here um, where it's not at all, you know, a political situation. It's just the, the, the most powerful military leader is the boss, is the shogun. In Japan, they don't use the word shogun it. They use the word bakufu, which literally means tent city. Um, and the idea here is it's a military government and, and they move around depending on where the battle is and live in tents. Now, that literally was, was the case initially until this tent city, Kamakura, becomes an actual city and it becomes the, the capital city. And what I want you to notice here is the name of the shogunate is the name of the city. In other words, that tradition of whatever the capital city is is also the name of the regime that's in power politically. As a consequence of all this, though, the imperial court is now completely ceremonial. There still is an emperor and there still is an imperial family, but now they have absolutely no political power. It all goes to the shogun. They're simply there as figureheads to perform certain rituals at certain times of the year, but they have absolutely no political power. Now, the shogunate starts off pretty strong under uh, Yoritomo, but there's some problems immediately, well, actually even before he dies. He is convinced that all of his sons are trying to kill him, and so he sort of takes a preemptive approach and starts killing his own sons for their suspected treachery. 
one of the consequences of this is by the time he reaches the end of his life, he's got no more sons left. Like there's a real question about who is supposed to take over after he dies. Right at about the same time though, the Mongols start showing up. Now they're trying to invade this island, Japan. And they, to do that, they're going to need to get on ships. And the first time they try to invade, it's actually kind of a funny story. Like they ride their horses on these ships and they have no idea what they're doing. And it's a complete disaster. I mean, the, the, the soldiers are getting sick, but so are all of the horses. And, and they don't really know what they're doing. But then they figure out, you know, what we need to do is we need to get people that know what we're, they're doing to lead us. And so they assemble a fleet of 4,400 ships, uh, which is a huge fleet that's piloted uh, mostly by Korean and Chinese sailors so that they have a little better idea what they're doing. And they are fully prepared to invade and take over Japan. However, while they're sailing over there, there is a, uh, a giant storm, a cyclone perhaps, we're not exactly sure, that wipes out a big portion of the fleet before they can even land. In theory, they should have steamrolled Japan, but the, the way the people in Japan see this is, this is the effect of a kamikaze. Kami, remember, means nature spirit. And kazi means wind. So it's sometimes translated as divine wind. And some of you might recall that's what uh, this technique that the air pilots in Japan in World War II use. But what is it's really going on is people are looking at that and like, oh, that must be a symbol from nature, a sign that we're supposed to reinstate the emperor who of course is seen as having a family tie to the sun. The kami are trying to tell us something. As a consequence, another clan, another family line, Hojo, takes over control of the government from uh, the line of uh, Minamoto Yoritomo. And they claim to be doing so in the name of the emperor. However, there is a uh, significant rebellion uh, against the Hojo clan taking over, and this guy is going to be a key figure. He's sent by the Hojo clan to put down the rebellion. That's his job. However, he's actually related to the Minamoto uh, clan, and he's actually the leader of their clan, although the Hojo don't know this, he goes to put down the rebellion, but then literally switches sides and now leads the rebels against the Hojo. Obviously, he's still bitter about the fact that his family, which had ruled in the Kamakura Shogunate, is now um, put out of power. So he's going to take those rebels and use them to reinstore power in him and his family line. However, he moves the capital city back to Kyoto. Notice, though, he does not change the name. The, the shogunate is now named after him. And this is a pretty significant event when you consider the fact that that was not the practice. He thinks so highly of himself, he's going to name the regime after himself. He is, in fact, a really strong and charismatic leader. However, um, his heirs are not so much. And this is going to create a serious, fun, seriously uh, fundamental problem. The system of a shogunate requires that the shogun is the boss, the military dictator. He has ultimate authority because he's the guy who can kill anybody who challenges him. But if the shogun is weak, what are the consequences of that? Well, the consequences of that are shortly after Ashkaga dies, the whole system breaks down into a Japanese version of feudalism. The emperor is still technically at the top of the hierarchy, but he has absolutely no political power. In theory, the shogun is supposed to be the boss, but he has no power. And so what ends up happening, the lords, the daimyo, 
end up fighting each other constantly for hundreds of years because they all want to take the title of shogun. It leads to a horribly decentralized situation. We'll definitely go more into this in class because it's obvious there's some pretty strong parallels between what's happening in Japan at this time and what's happening in Western Europe in their version of feudalism. I want to thank you for your time and I look forward to seeing you in class.